uh, don't hesitate to jump in with your questions. <clears throat> so the first um, part of today, uh, we're going to uh, revisit a few of the topics that Christoph uh, briefly touched on yesterday, focusing here on the concepts and methods in orthology uh, and less on the sort of uh, phylogenetics and tree theory that Christoph uh, concentrated on uh, yesterday. Then we'll take a short break. Um, just like yesterday, we'll have the breakout rooms, which are totally optional, of course. Um, you can go and get a coffee or you can stay in a breakout room and say hello to whoever else is uh, joining this morning. Then in the second session, uh, I'm gonna switch a bit and talk about uh, how we use uh, benchmarking universal single copy orthologs to assess the uh, completeness of uh, genomic data. So walking you through a little bit of the behind the scenes of uh, what uh, Busco does and how it does it. Uh, and then finally, at the end, uh, instead of talking about uh, concepts and methods, I want to just present a few concrete examples of uh, a question in comparative genomics, uh, the approach that we took to try to address that uh, question, and uh, the answer that we were able to, to reach. So a bit more of a sort of a cookbook recipe style uh, with examples of using orthology data to answer questions in comparative genomics. So for the first uh, session, we're gonna focus on concepts and methods in orthology. And hopefully by the end of this, uh, this class, this lecture, um, you will have a better answer to each of these three questions. Firstly, uh, what do we mean by orthology? Then uh, a little bit on the methodology behind how we actually go about uh, delineating orthologs. And finally, uh, well, why, why do we do this at all? Uh, why do we need orthology in our lives? So before I focus on uh, orthology itself, I think it's worth uh, taking a step back and thinking about uh, orthology as a sort of child term of the parent term homology, um, where uh, orthology is a subclass of homology. So we need to first talk uh, about what we mean by homology before getting into the details of what we mean by orthology. In essence, homology is simply uh, the designation of a relationship of common descent between any entities. So there is no uh, further explicit uh, specification of any evolutionary scenario. It simply posits that any entities uh, have evolved from a common ancestor. So they, they share a common ancestry. And uh, I put this uh, review at the bottom here of this slide by uh, Kuhnin, even though it's from uh, 2005, uh, it's in Annual Reviews in Genetics. And he very elegantly summarizes a lot of the concepts that we are going to be uh, talking about uh, today. Uh, such as uh, the relationships between homology and orthology and parallelology and the use of orthology in evolutionary genomics. So orthology then takes it further and uh, specifies that this common ancestry for genes in particular mean that the genes originate from a single ancestral gene in the last common ancestor of the species that are being compared. So you can see how the more uh, general definition of homology, which simply posits common ancestry, now becomes a much more specific definition when we're talking about orthology, because we introduce the evolutionary scenario of the last common ancestor of the species that we are comparing. Now, parallelogy is another uh, child term of homology, where genes are simply related by gene duplication rather than by speciation. So paralogs are genes in the same genome of a given species and have originated by duplication. Here we don't yet specify where or when this duplication occurred, simply that the two genes currently reside in the same genome. So putting them all together, we have uh, the general term of homology, 
that simply posits a common ancestry. And the two child terms of orthologs and paralogs, where orthologs arise through speciation events and paralogs arise through gene duplication events. Now, in the world of genomics, of course, we are focusing on uh, the use of sequence homology to define orthologs and paralogs in the genomes of species that we are sequencing today. So we need to first think a little bit about what we mean by sequence homology. So homology at the sequence level, whether it be between uh, protein or DNA sequences, is typically inferred from their sequence similarity. So here we're just looking at uh, protein sequence alignment. And even if you've never really looked at alignments before, you can see that there are a number of residues that are identical or similar between these two sequences. So what sequence homology search tools, such as the all famous BLAST, are trying to achieve is simply to detect an excess level of similarity between two sequences. So greater similarity or greater identity than expected by chance. Uh, so basically a statistically significant sequence similarity. Where we have to be careful here is uh, when thinking about sequence homology is this link between uh, what I was just talking about here, the statistically significant sequence similarity and the definition of homology, because it is often uh, misunderstood. And Bill Pearson's uh, introduction to sequence similarity homology searching uh, sets this out quite well. Just to be clear, a pair of sequences, just as we saw on the previous slide, can have high or low sequence similarity. But this does not translate to strong or weak homology. So even though you might see uh, in uh, scientific papers even uh, this phrase uh, referring to uh, protein in the mouse has strong homology to protein in the human, uh, this is technically incorrect language. Homology is simply the conclusion, i.e. given a particular level of similarity, the sequences are likely to have risen from a common ancestor. Hence the uh, expectation or E value associated with uh, a BLAST sequence search or other sequence searches. So this is something to bear in mind uh, when thinking about uh, what we mean by homology and the distinction with uh, sequence similarity or sequence identity itself. And uh, just to uh, point that out that it's still worth mentioning this in 2020. So if you uh, search for strong homology in PubMed uh, today, you will see that uh, the misuse of this term has been growing over the decades until I guess um, people like Bill uh, Pearson pointed out this uh, misunderstanding and slowly but surely this incorrect use of uh, this term has been decreasing. So uh, I think in 2020 we have about 10 so far publications with that exact phrase in. Um, so if you do see it uh, you are not alone um, but hopefully by the end of today you'll have a better understanding of uh, this distinction and hopefully avoid using it in your own texts. So we've talked about uh, the general uh, term of homology and the child terms of orthology and parology. Now, where do they come from? Um, the term uh, homologue itself was introduced by Richard Owen back in uh, 1843, long before sequences, long before DNA, um, long before uh, uh, evolution really, uh, to designate simply the same organ in different animals under a variety of form and function. So already recognizing that although we're different species, uh, living in different niches, there are commonalities that would suggest uh, that they are the equivalent organ in different animals. So although we might think of this concept as being uh, extremely uh, useful to think of when, uh, trying to understand uh, evolution, Darwin himself actually never used the term homology. 
But very quickly after the publication of The Origin of Species, uh, in fact, Huxley, when he reviewed Darwin's work, invoked uh, homology as evidence of evolution. For us, it might be very clear that uh, having the same organ in different animals under a variety of form and function and starting to think about how that could have happened, it's obvious, at least now, that there is some common ancestry and that they have descended from some common uh, uh, entity in a last common ancestor. But this wasn't obviously that obvious uh, in the late 1800s. So that just uh, gives you a little bit of history about where some of these uh, terms have come from. Uh, a, uh, a century later, Walter Fitch actually now uh, in this sort of classic paper actually begins to really define the terms uh, of orthologs and paralogs. Now, of course, in the sequence era, because uh, we have uh, protein sequences and we can really see through sequence alignments uh, how the relationships between different sequences uh, match up to our understanding of the different uh, relationships between the animals that they come from. So the distinction uh, was first introduced by Walter Fitch in 1970. So enough of the history lessons. Um, now I just want to walk through a very simple uh, scenario uh, using a tree-like form, which uh, you got to grips with with uh, Christoph yesterday, um, to uh, describe the most simplest uh, inheritance from a last common ancestor. So here we have six uh, species, frog, duck, rat, mouse, chimp, and human, and the last common ancestor of all six species. Now, under the most simple evolutionary scenario, the only thing that we have happening are the speciation events at each node here on the tree, resulting in two descendant uh, lineages, giving rise to a single copy orthologue in each of the six species that we are comparing since their last common ancestor. Now, of course, evolution isn't always that simple you don't just have speciation events. We also have, for example, gene loss events. So this is a really simple one to uh, understand and to illustrate. Uh, this gene has simply been lost somewhere in the history of the duck lineage and is therefore missing. And so we have still a relatively simple evolutionary scenario uh, just by introducing a single gene loss event where the rest uh, of the genes in each of the other five species remain as single copy orthologs. Now, of course, the other thing that can happen along the way, as uh, Christoph described yesterday, are of course gene duplication events. And here we've just um, added a copy in the human lineage to create human gene one and human gene two. So now we have single copy orthologs in uh, those four, four species and a pair of paralogs in the human genome. Then, of course, uh, not all gene gains necessarily are young and lineage specific. We can have older gene gains. So here in the common ancestor of both rat and mouse, a gene duplication event created a second copy in the common ancestor. This results in a pair of rat paralogs, gene one and two, and a pair of mouse paralogs, gene one and two. Altogether, these genes still form an orthologous group, all descended from the single gene in the last common ancestor of these six species. Now, at least one other evolutionary scenario that we uh, should consider is, of course, sequence evolution. The other uh, scenario that we were looking at earlier, losses and gains, was just um, considering uh, copy number evolution. But of course, uh, sequence evolution is inherent as well. So imagine that for here we had this um, duplication in the ancestor of rat and mouse that was followed by fast sequence divergence. And here in this tree-like form, we normally represent that with uh, longer branch lengths. So you can begin to see how our relatively simple scenario that started off just with um, speciation events can start to get more and more complex 
as we add uh, more and more uh, realistic evolutionary events, such as losses, duplications, and rapid sequence evolution. So altogether, these genes uh, form an orthologous group consisting of the rat paralogs, the mouse paralogs, the human paralogs, the single chimp gene, and the single frog gene, because they're all descended from this last common ancestor of the six species that we are comparing. So here's a different representation of the same sort of concept, whereby we have four species, A, B, C, and D, each with uh, um, different uh, numbers of genes in them, and uh, depicted in a tree-like fashion, the evolutionary scenario from the last common ancestor of A and B to the last common ancestor of all four species, and the last common ancestor of species C and D. And I think this helps to illustrate um, why the uh, definition of where your last common ancestor is, is important. So from the perspective of last common ancestor one, where we only have two species, we have an orthologous group consisting of gene A1, B1, and B2. All the genes that descended from that ancestral gene in last common ancestor one including this duplication event. Now, if we move to last common ancestor two, so the root of all four species, again, we include all the genes descended from that single gene in the last common ancestor. A1, B1, B2, C2, C3, C1 is missing because of a loss event, D1, D2, and D3. So all of these genes would cluster together in a single orthologous group taking into account the two old duplication events that happened in this lineage and the one young duplication event that happened in this species. Now, this is where it perhaps becomes uh, more interesting for illustrative purposes. If we consider the last common ancestor three here, which is simply the ancestor of species C and species D, now hopefully you can see that in their last common ancestor, there were three genes because these two duplications happened prior to this speciation event. So we have three distinct copies of this gene in last common ancestor three. So if we're delineating orthology just between species C and species D, we now have a much more fine scaled resolution where we have uh, one group consisting of C2, D2, another group consisting of C3, D3, and a singleton D3, uh, D1, because of the loss in species C of C1. So broadly speaking, homology is simply uh, the task of recognizing similarities and using that as an evidence of shared ancestry. When we refine that and introduce the concept of the last common ancestor and talk about genes in particular, we can define orthology or orthologs as arising by vertical descent from a single gene in the last common ancestor of the species under consideration. This inherently means that orthology is a hierarchical concept, as I hope I was able to demonstrate with this figure, and that it is relative to the species radiation under consideration. So you're going to get much more fine scaled resolution if you don't go back so far in time, and you're gonna get much broader scale, larger, orthologous groups consisting of all genes descended from that last gene in the common ancestor when you go further back in evolutionary time. And this uh, gives rise to the concept of our orthologous groups that try to capture all of the genes that have descended from a single gene in the last common ancestor. So Hopefully uh, that has helped set the groundwork, if you like, for some of the concepts uh, in orthology. And just to check that you're paying attention, uh, I would like you to please quickly answer this quiz question. And don't worry, the link is going to appear in the chat now. Ah, oh, there it is, okay, excellent. Um, so you don't have to type out that horrible URL uh, yourselves. Um, given uh, what we've just been through in the last uh, 25 minutes or so, um, which description uh, best describes your understanding of orthology? Uh, 
orthologs are genes in different species that have evolved from an ancestral gene without duplications or losses that perform the same specific biological function that evolved from a single gene in the last common ancestor that have the highest significant sequence homology or that produce a gene tree that matches the species phylogeny. And hopefully I can switch to the results and see if any of you have been listening. Okay, 46 responses, that's not bad. Out of 72, 48, okay. So I think I may have mentioned that uh, uh, orthologs are genes descended from a single gene in the last common ancestor a few times in the last 25 minutes. And it definitely sunk in with 90% uh, of you, uh, for the time being at least, uh, reaching the correct conclusion. Okay, so now we go back to PowerPoint. There we go. <clears throat> Are there any questions on the first part, um, talking about definitions and concepts and history? I don't see yet any in the uh, quiz. And I see one. How is speciation defined? Ooh. We could, we could, uh, we could certainly, uh, yes, tough question. Uh, we could certainly talk about that for uh, a very long time. So technically speciation occurs when two populations are no longer reproductively uh, fertile. Uh, that's one working definition, if you like. So over evolutionary time, populations may be separated either geographically or genetically. Uh, and eventually become so separated that they are no longer able to produce fertile offspring. Uh, and therefore you have uh, two new species emerging from the ancestral species. Uh, I think we'll probably leave it at that for, for this because it is a, it is a rather tough question. Um, okay, we have another question coming in. How is the species tree decided? Again, another tough question. So uh, in the uh, examples that I gave, it was fairly, uh, how should we say, uh, non-controversial um, because we're looking at frog, duck, rat, mouse, chimp, and human. Now, um, if you were to add a bat in there, for example, or a horse, some of these nodes are a little bit contentious and jump around a bit. Um, essentially, uh, one of the uses of orthologs is to collect enough uh, common markers across the species of interest to build a, a sequence alignment using as many uh, single copy orthologs as possible and to use all the changes that have accumulated in all the species to try to infer the most robust species phylogeny. Um, and we'll probably, yes, we will, we will touch on that um, in the second part uh, this morning. Some paralogs are useful. Why did you decide to with mainly orthologs? There must be some good paralogs as well. Uh, okay, so I was talking about for inferring the species phylogeny. Um, generally, we try to stick with uh, single copy orthologs because, in fact, if I go back to the very first um, slide, what I was talking about here is this um, super simple evolutionary scenario where only speciation events have occurred. So we haven't had any duplications, we haven't had any losses, and we haven't had any rapid sequence evolution. Therefore, these kinds of orthologs are going to be the most useful to determine the species phylogeny because their evolutionary history exactly matches the species evolutionary history. Um, yes, there are cases, of course, where um, uh, paralogs and losses and um, uh, where those 
duplications and losses have occurred that could help you to infer the species phylogeny, but uh, that would use uh, slightly different methods than what I was talking about in terms of um, sequence alignment of universal single copy orthologs to reach uh, a best estimate of the species phylogeny. Okay, good. So uh, now I will move on to uh, a little bit more of the methodology rather than the concepts um, and focusing now on how we actually go about delineating uh, orthology. And uh, just to advertise uh, Christoph's uh, book chapter here, uh, which gives a very good overview and uh, detailed discussion with lots of examples of uh, different types of methods and approaches for inferring uh, orthology and porology, which we will not be able to cover in detail today, but I just want to give you a flavor of what's out there. <clears throat> um, so overall, they can be separated into uh, graph-based approaches and tree-based approaches. So what do we uh, mean uh, by that? Uh, first of all, uh, this is just to illustrate to you that there are lots of different methods both for tree-based approaches and for graph-based approaches. And I think that um, a lot of people can be, become rather overwhelmed by the choice of methods that are available uh, and which one to go for for their particular uh, data set, for their particular question. Um, and hopefully we can uh, discuss a little bit about this uh, um, further. But here, just broadly speaking, to try to um, illustrate the difference uh, conceptually between the tree-based approaches and the graph-based approaches. Actually here, I think that um, this illustration shows how they are really aiming for uh, a very um, a similar outcome, just using slightly different approaches. So here we have uh, the same tree that we saw earlier. And basically you're using sequence alignments to build gene trees, to infer the orthologous relationships between the genes or proteins in the species of uh, interest or the species that you've sequenced and annotated. And the graph-based approach is similar, except that instead of um, trying to infer a tree-like relationship between all the proteins in your extant species, instead we start off with an all-against-all pairwise uh, distance matrix between all the genes in all the extant species. And then we try to analyze this graph to uh, determine the last common ancestor and all the orthologs descended from that last common ancestor. So which approaches are best? I think that would probably be a three-day conference in and of itself to try to fully answer uh, a question of which is uh, the best um, orthology delineation approach. Uh, lots of um, benchmarking has gone in to try to assess the performance of different methods, either using uh, reference uh, sets uh, for benchmarking or uh, different metrics that compare uh, the performance in terms of uh, recovery of uh, false uh, positives or true positives based on some sort of golden uh, standard. So here, the golden standard of uh, reference uh, gene trees or uh, curated protein families can be used. And for now, I think um, I will direct you to the Quest of Orthologs website if you want to learn a bit more about uh, some of the different methods that are out there and how they perform uh, in these uh, different benchmarking studies. Okay, so a little question here. Is it possible to convert tree-based approach to graph-based approach? So I'm not quite sure what you mean by convert. Um, I think, so if we go back um, here, I try to illustrate that conceptually they are trying to achieve very similar things. Um, and yes, of course, if you have all the pairwise distances between the proteins of interest, you could imagine inferring a tree from that. Um, but the graph-based approaches are trying to avoid, generally, 
the computationally expensive task of trying to compute this tree in the first place. So there really are two diverging strategies to try to tackle the same kind of question. Um, and the the, one of the advantages of graph-based approaches is that you don't have to perform all the multiple um, sequence alignments, which you would then need to infer the trees, which you use to then infer the orthologous and parologous relationships. So here we just have six species. You can imagine that's a fairly tractable computational problem. But imagine you have uh, all the thousands of bacteria in uh, NCBI and you're trying to create a multiple sequence alignment and use that to infer orthologous and parologous relationships. Then suddenly the computational task becomes a lot more challenging and perhaps you might opt for a graph-based approach where the alignments are all pairwise, so you still have to make a lot of alignments, but overall the task is a lot less uh, computationally demanding. Okay, so um, we're not going to discuss all the pros and cons of tree-based versus uh, graph-based approaches uh, in the time that we have today, but I point you to some of the resources out there uh, to learn a bit more about that. So because um, I have most experience uh, in my postdocs working on the OrthoDB hierarchical uh, catalog of orthologs, I would like to spend a few minutes just discussing how OrthoDB goes about um, delineating orthologs. And this is an example, if you like, of a, a graph-based approach. So the first step is to uh, select your input data. And just like any uh, orthology resource, you first need the proteins from all your species of interest. And we also collect uh, as much functional information as we possibly can about those um, uh, proteins. So usually those are coming from model organisms um, where most uh, experimental work has been carried out. Because as we'll see uh, later, one of the main uses of orthology data is to be able to make hypotheses on gene function from genes in newly sequenced species based on their orthology to genes in species where a lot more experimental uh, work has gone on to try to understand the functions of the genes. <clears throat> the first step then is to select the longest protein coding transcript from any genes with alternative transcripts because we're performing a gene-based uh, orthology delineation. Then for each species, we first filter their sets of proteins to remove uh, highly identical sequences. So here we have three yellow ones and four red ones that are uh, highly identical. And we just select one uh, protein sequence representative to go through as input for clustering. Then we perform all against all um, Smith-Waterman pairwise alignment, in our case using a software called Swipe. Um, this is to begin to build the graph that I was talking about earlier. So basically we have all the proteins from species A and we compare them with all the proteins in species B to find what we call best reciprocal hits. So the best match from A to B is reciprocally the best match from B to A. Now in uh, some cases, of course, we can have more than one match. But what we're looking for is this reciprocal nature of the best hit. So the best from hit from A to B is mirrored by the best hit from B to A to form what we call this BRH or best reciprocal hit. Now you can imagine that when you have a lot of um, proteins from coming from the whole genome, uh, themselves being homologous, so lots of kinases, lots of proteases, lots of large gene families, um, zinc finger uh, proteins, etc. This is when um, the best reciprocal hit uh, can break down, where the best hit from species A to species B is not matched reciprocally from species B to species A. So we start with the uh, best reciprocal hits, and here it just shows why uh, we started by removing uh, the very highly similar proteins to start with. So imagine we have two homologs in species A, which are distinguishable enough, so uh, less than 97% identical. 
from the perspective of species B, we can find a clear winner and therefore we can define a best reciprocal hit. Whereas if we have two proteins in species A that are highly identical, so 99% identical, from the perspective of species B, they would score basically the same and therefore you could lose um, the possibility of finding the best reciprocal hit. So that's simply a technical reason why we remove them to start off with. Then clustering proceeds from the best scoring, uh, best reciprocal hits between pairs of species. So here A and B, moving down the list to lower and lower scores. Forming triangles with certain cutoffs. So with a species C is a best reciprocal hit with species A here. And then we ask the question, does that close the triangle between C and B? Yes, it does. This begins to form the core of our uh, orthologous group. As we move down uh, the list of best reciprocal hits, the distances, if you like, start to increase, but we're still um, requiring a reciprocal hit between each species here, A and D. And then again, asking, does it close the triangle with another species that is already a member of the cluster? If so, then it can join the orthologous group. <clears throat> we keep uh, growing the orthologous group, uh, adding more and more distantly related species, so long as they form uh, triangles that close uh, the uh, best reciprocal hit triangles and allow the new genes to enter the orthologous group. Now those which don't form triangles, but which themselves do form best reciprocal hits, are also allowed to join the orthologous groups, but we have a slightly more stringent cutoff. So here we have a protein from uh, species G, which forms a best reciprocal hit with species F, but with none of the other species in other proteins in the orthologous group. We apply a more stringent cutoff and we allow it to join the group. <clears throat> Um, just very briefly on this uh, alignment overlap requirement. So in a pairwise alignment, you can have the full sequence um, being uh, alignable and therefore homologous between species A and species B. Then when you add species C, what we're asking for is that there is a commonality in this alignment region. So this green bit here between A and B and between B and C and between C and A. So we are comparing um, like for like regions. Instead of the situation here, where between A, B and C, A and B match over here, B and C match over here, and A and C match over here, and there is no overline, uh, overlap between their region. <clears throat> so finally, we have to uh, think about uh, how we also consider what we call in parallelogous groups. So these are within species homologues that form uh, distinct clusters during the clustering procedure. So here we have essentially the same uh, group that we were building uh, earlier. And we have a trio out here uh, with species A, B, and C that is nevertheless homologous to uh, the proteins in this uh, major cluster. So these black lines are simply indicating that they are um, within species homolog ho homologues. So A is uh, homologous to A prime, B is homologous to B prime, and C is homologous to C prime. This is conceptually slightly hard to grasp. So we resort uh, to our tree-like uh, visualization. And this is essentially the scenario that we're talking about here. So from the last common ancestor of species A to G, what we're talking about here with this A prime, B prime, and C prime is essentially a duplication that occurred here at the last common ancestor of species A, B, and C to produce this in parallelogous group here and here, which from the perspective of the last common ancestor of all of these species should be included and should join this orthologous group because they are all descended from the last common ancestor gene. Um, finally, uh, we also add um, in paralogs. So these are singletons from the same species that didn't join any other cluster. Uh, 
And the very last step is going back to those uh, highly identical protein sequences that we excluded in the first step, and of course, adding them back to form the final group. <clears throat> so we have a quick question here from, can you quickly clarify, does um, within species homology equal perology in parology? Uh, yes, uh, again, from the perspective of the last common ancestor. So if I just go back to this tree, uh, where's that, that tree, okay. So if we were only looking at species A, B, and C, then we would form one orthologous group with the primes, A prime, B prime, C prime, and one orthologous group with A, B, C. But because we've gone further back in evolutionary time, all the way to E, F, and G, these are now uh, paralogs in species A, B, and C, and should be considered a part of this orthologous group. Hopefully that um, clarifies the situation. And actually it's a good question because um, it really highlights the perspective of which last common ancestor you are considering and how that affects the resolution of the orthologous groups that you're going to obtain. Okay, so quickly, I think I'll skip that because it's a bit complicated. Uh, okay, uh, and finish here with uh, a real world example of the kind of graft based approach. So here we have, I think this is in vertebrates, yes, okay. And these are all the um, distances, if you like, the similarities between um, two groups of proteins, uh, POP3 up here and POP2 down here. What you can see is that um, within each orthologous group, there is a very high level um, of uh, connectivity. So lots of best reciprocal hits connecting all the proteins in POP3 group and POP2 group. However, because of uh, missing genes in four species in POP2 and in several species in POP3, what we find is that the best reciprocal hits start to cross between POP2 and POP3. So this is just a nice example of how messy real data can actually be. Um, when trying to use a graph-based approach uh, to delineate orthologs. Okay, so that's uh, the uh, methodo methodological uh, considerations, if you like. Um, and so I would ask you now to fill out uh, the second little quiz uh, which you should hopefully receive the link for in uh, the chat. And I see there's a question from uh, about the resolution. So uh, do we have quiz B. Okay, so the link now for the second quiz is uh, in the chat. And let's see this question here. Why are you reducing this to 97% resolution? Whereas in BLAST, the higher the similarity, the better. Um, okay, I'll try to interpret that question. Um, I think for, um, you're, you're referring to the 97% uh, filtering that we did before starting to build the uh, graphs of pairwise relationships between all the proteins. So I had to, I, I went through that a little bit um, fast perhaps. Um, Basically, highly closely, uh, highly similar proteins from the same genome mean that when you compare proteins from different species, you could get almost exactly the same BLAST E value or exactly the same um, uh, alignment bit score to those two highly similar proteins in species B. Therefore, we choose just one representative rather than including both of those in the all against all search to improve the recall of best reciprocal hits. Then at the very last step of the clustering, if the representative protein made it into an orthologous group, 
then it's highly similar, 97% identical. Paralog will join that orthologous group. So this is a, a technical specification. And obviously um, one might uh, alter these parameters depending on whether you are looking at uh, species that are very closely related, evolutionarily speaking, or if you're going much further back in time. But this is just the default. We have another question here on how to add gene expression distance to the sequence distance in the overall BRHs. Okay, I'm not sure. So here we're not talking about expression at all. Um, but it could, uh, it, because we're talking about trying to delineate the evolutionary relationships between uh, proteins in extant uh, species. Um, but it is possibly something that we might um, talk about later. Um, and okay, one final question. Is there a way to calculate the likelihood that one orthologue can be missed in one species clade? due to real loss or bad genome annotation? So that's an excellent question because it is exactly um, <laughs> what we will come on to in uh, the second uh, lecture this morning and of course the exercises uh, this afternoon. So I think here I will switch to see the results of the poll quickly uh, and then we will take our first uh, break for the morning. So I just need to get a quiz be up and running. Okay, 41 responses. Um, what was the question? Which description best describes your understanding of how AuthorDB delineates orthology? Uh, I need to click responses. Okay. So you definitely got it. Best reciprocal hits determine how genes are progressively added to form orthologous groups. Um, okay, so we are now one hour and four minutes into this morning's session. So it's probably a good time um, to take a pause. Um, yesterday, we launched some breakout rooms and some of you joined them. Uh, the idea of these breakout rooms is simply to say hello to other people who are uh, joined uh, for this morning, uh, but you don't have to, and you're more than welcome to go and grab a coffee, take a short break, and I will aim to be back uh, uh, to start, let's say, at five past ten. So according to my clock, that is in... Uh, 13 minutes time. Um, so uh, take a break, grab a coffee, say hello on the breakout room, uh, and we will be back to uh, the second part at five past ten. Uh, see you later. And before we do so, there's a question about um, fast evolving sequences. So if we fail to find a good best reciprocal hit, are these going into outgroups in the graph or are they basically simply excluded from the orthology analysis? Would you be able to account for local syntony in these cases? Uh, as some kinds of proteins, for example, zinc fingers, often emerge uh, in cysts or nearby in the genome. So there are some uh, orthology delineation uh, techniques that do take syntony into account. Um, they can be useful for res resolving some of these uh, tricky situations, if you like. Uh, and yes, uh, fast sequence evolution after gene duplication will often result in those uh, descendants being called as a completely separate, distinct uh, orthologous group. So when you find uh, orthologous uh, or orthologs that appear to be um, restricted to a specific lineage, uh, 
So for example, um, an, an ortholog that is only found in rodents, for example. There are two evolutionary scenarios here that we can think of. One would be that it is a, a de novo gene that was born in the ancestor of rodents and therefore really does not have any orthologs um, in other mammals. The other would be uh, what we were just talking about, so a duplication in that uh, ancestral lineage that was followed by rapid sequence evolution, leading to it no longer being able to be recognized as an orthologue, uh, and therefore it's being called as an orthologous group that appears specific to the rodents. Um, if you think about it in terms of uh, a tree, you can imagine that uh, after the duplication, you would then have a very, very long branch length because of the relaxed constraint uh, on sequence evolution of, of, of the descendants of, those, of that uh, duplication. And uh, depending on where you cut the tree, you would either uh, be able to include those genes as orthologs, or you would indeed um, exclude them from the orthologous group and they would form their own independent orthologous group. So there is no golden solution, if you like, um, for, for that kind of scenario, um, but it, it certainly does happen. So that's a very uh, valid uh, question. <clears throat> okay, so now I will try to share my screen for the second part of this morning's presentation. There we go. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. And for those of you who may be just joining now, um, again, feel free to say hello in the chat. Ask your questions in the uh, Google Doc and, and the Zoom chat as we progress through the lectures. Uh, and I will try to answer as many as I can as we go along and the rest uh, will try to provide answers for you in the Google Doc, especially if they're uh, a bit more complicated to uh, respond to immediately. <clears throat> right. Uh, wait, what I want is my laser pointer, which is here. There we go. Okay. So in this uh, second uh, session now, we are going to switch uh, from purely talking about uh, orthologs and paralogs um, to uh, actually using orthology data to assess the quality of genomic data with the tool called BUSCO, the Benchmarking Universal Single Copy Orthologs. <clears throat> and hopefully at the end of this session, you will be able to answer the following three questions. So a little bit about uh, what BUSCO actually is, uh, what it's attempting to do, how it, uh, how it goes about its business, if you like, and uh, finally, uh, why we need it, which uh, from the questions that we see in the chat already, uh, it's, it's, it's um, quite clear how these uh, universal single copy orthologs can be used uh, in different scenario for assessing quality as well as um, other interesting evolutionary questions in comparative genomics. So, even though you're all on mute, I can, I can sort of hear you groaning when you see this slide again uh, of the fall in cost of sequencing over the years. At least this one is updated, so it goes to uh, July 2020. Uh, but it's really to illustrate the point that um, over the last few decades, we've gone from recognizing what DNA is and being able to see it and look at chromosomes to being able to sequence it and then to be able to sequence it a lot. So we're now reaching this, uh, what we call uh, nucleotide resolution of uh, genetic and genomic data. And uh, there's a huge flood of new sequence data arriving every single day. Uh, in terms of uh, arthropods, which of course my favorite animal group, um, here we're just illustrating the increase in the number of uh, fully sequenced genomes over the years that we uh, have been including in our OrthoDB uh, catalog of orthologs with 
the uh, latest version, AuthorDB 10, now uh, consisting of uh, 170 arthropods and uh, 1,200 uh, eukaryotes. So as I alluded to earlier, um, the tree-based approaches where you are required to align all the sequences in order to infer the tree, to then infer uh, orthology and paralogy relationships, become computationally very, very expensive when you're talking about thousands of species. Um, so in the world of arthropods here, uh, a more up-to-date view of the genomes that are uh, currently available uh, and uh, the different uh, orders for which we have uh, samples. So you see across the whole of arthropoda, we have more than 500 uh, assemblies for different species. Um, and several of those species have been done more than once. So there are different versions of those assemblies. This um, uh, lighter purple bar at the top just represents uh, resequencing or reassembly of um, species for which we already have at least one genome. So the amount of data is increasing every single day. And here um, I choose to uh, show the example of the I5K initiative. So sequencing of uh, 5,000 arthropod genomes um, here we're just showing the number of predicted genes in each of these species versus the assembly size for um, previously sequenced arthropods and arthropods that were sequenced as part of the uh, I5K uh, pilot project. And what I'm just trying to demonstrate here is that uh, over the years now, um, we are more and more able to sequence and annotate uh, larger and larger genomes. So. A lot of the species that were some of the first to have their genome sequenced and annotated were specifically selected because they had very small genomes. So they were much more tractable when uh, the cost of sequencing was much, much higher. Nowadays, uh, we can move into uh, much larger genomes, a much more diverse uh, set of species to sample the genomic diversity that is out there. But this, of course, raises the important question. Uh, how can we gauge the quality of all of these resources that we are generating? Which is a very important question uh, when it comes to downstream analysis in comparative genomics. As uh, someone alluded to in the chat, how do we know if a gene is lost because of a real evolutionary event or it was simply uh, missed uh, due to technical problems with the genome sequencing, genome assembly, or the genome annotation steps. And so the first thing or the first question that you might ask um, to try to gauge the quality of these genomic resources is simply, does the assembly size uh, match the expected genome size? So we're not going to go into uh, details of how one might achieve that, um, but it's certainly a very important question to ask. Um, when dealing with uh, newly sequenced genomes. Now, the second question is hopefully familiar to some of you, but it's more of a technical uh, definition. So we're asking the question, how fragmented is this genome assembly? The ideal genome assembly will come in as many parts as there are haploid chromosomes for that given species. But that's not the reality. Genome sequencing is, is uh, difficult and assembly is hard. And so what we end up with uh, quite often are contigs and scaffolds that, um, for which we don't necessarily know the complete order and orientation according to the carrier type or the chromosome structure for the given species. And so here we'll often hear spoken of this term called uh, the N50, so the contig or scaffold N50 size. And this is a, a measurement of the level of fragmentation of your assembly, uh, simply specifying that half of the assembly is found on contigs or scaffolds of length N50 or greater. So it gives you an idea of how contiguous your genome assembly is. Now, a third question that often gets overlooked is uh, how gappy is your assembly? So if you have all of these small little red chunks here and you just simply glue them together with ends to denote unsequenced or unknown uh, regions of the genome, you will start to improve your N50 uh, value because more of the genome will be contained in longer 
contiguous scaffolds. But uh, because of introducing the ends, your assembly remains uh, still somewhat gappy with missing information. A fourth question that you can ask is simply, uh, does the assembly contain all of the genes that it is expected to? One way of trying to answer that question is to uh, sequence the transcriptomes from multiple life stages or different conditions, and then try to map those back to the assembly. So you're asking the question, how many of the expressed genes in my species can I find when I search the genome assembly? And if you can't find all of them, then your genome assembly is likely missing some of the genes that should be present in your species. So um, that's one way, but of course, that requires you to do transcriptomics to get the samples, and it's very species specific. So you would have to do it for every single species that you look at. So an alternative is to simply ask the question, how many of the expected genes are actually present in this assembly? And this is where uh, Busco comes into play. So what do we mean by evolutionarily expected genes? Here I highlight uh, the blue fractions, which are what we're calling widespread orthologs. So in this kind of uh, typical uh, orthology uh, plot, what we have here on the left are the species and their evolutionary relationships. And the bar charts are simply the counts of proteins in each species or group of species. And uh, the extent to which we can find orthologs across the full representation of these species. So the blue ones here have orthologs in almost all species. And as we move to the right, uh, they become lineage specific. So here we have dipteran specific orthologs, lepidopteran specific orthologs, coleopteran specific orthologs, hymenopteran specific orthologs, etc. So these are genes that uh, orthology could only be found within that uh, group of organisms. And finally, on the right, we have either genes that e exhibit some level of homology to genes in other species, but not enough to delineate orthology, and species-specific or lineage-specific genes for which no significant homology could be obtained. The evolutionarily expected genes are these ones in blue here. Because they are found in most organisms, we expect that when we sequence a new organism from this group, we should find these genes. So instead of talking about genes to try and get this concept across, here we just talk about physical attributes. So let's say you've been studying flies for many, many years and you are counting the features that you consistently observe in all the species of flies that you look at. So you would say they all have six legs, they all have two eyes, they all have one pair of wings, etc. Therefore, if a new fly comes along, someone says, this is definitely a fly, there would be an expectation that this new species should have also six legs, two eyes, one pair of wings, etc. <clears throat> so this is simply what we mean with this evolutionary expectation, but in terms of genes now, instead of um, morphological features. And I should say uh, at this point that this concept of using um, evolutionarily conserved genes to define this expectation is not a new one that we completely invented um, when we started to develop Busco. And many of you um, may have heard of uh, the previous uh, incarnation, if you like, uh, SEGMA, so the core eukaryotic genes mapping approach, um, which uh, identified about 250 uh, genes present in five uh, eukaryotic species and defined these as universally conserved genes that you should be able to find in any newly sequenced eukaryotic genome. Um, so it's uh, Busco uh, uh, builds on this conceptual concept um, and assesses many, many more uh, lineages now. So I should uh, also thank uh, the, the Corf Lab and, and Keith uh, Bradman for uh, their support in promoting uh, the use of alternative tools such as Busco since uh, Sigma has been uh, discontinued. I also want to take uh, this opportunity to say that, you know, 
there's a whole team of people working on the Busco project. Um, um, so Felipe and I worked on the original uh, implementation and then uh, Mathieu took over for the subsequent version and now uh, Matthew is working on the latest release. And so when you uh, ask for help, um, these are the people uh, that will be providing it to you. So it's not just me, it's a, a whole team behind the resource. Okay, so now to go back to this concept of evolutionarily expected genes and these uh, widespread uh, blue genes. Now, if we just take a slice and turn it on its side, um, Busco is actually looking for both widespread and unique genes. So here we just delineated these genes according to how widespread or how restricted they are, but we also need to consider a second dimension which is their uniqueness. So how often are they found as single copy orthologs as opposed to multi-copy orthologs resulting from gene duplication events? So this is a slightly complicated uh, graph to understand, but basically this is representing these two dimensions that I was talking about. So the orange dimension here is uh, duplicability from orthologs that are mostly found as single copy genes in all species examined to those that are found mostly as multi-copy genes in all species examined. And the second dimension here, the green dimension of universality, orthologs that are widespread, so they are found in almost all the species, to those that are very specific or sparsely distributed across the set of species that we are examining. And this landscape is uh, one uh, built for Drosophila melanogaster with orthology from 80 different insect species and delineating uh, the distribution of orthologous groups in these two dimensions. So hopefully you can already guess where on this uh, orthology landscape, uh, the benchmarking universal single copy orthologs might sit. Hopefully you were also looking at this peak in the back corner here, um, where they are mostly single copy and very widespread. So these genes are found in the majority of species as single copy orthologs. This gives rise to the evolutionary expectation that for any newly sequenced genome, you should be able to locate and find and annotate orthologs of these genes. And Busco implements uh, assessments in three different forms to allow users to assess the completeness of their genome assemblies, but also of their annotated gene sets. So that's the um, genes that you annotate in your genome assembly, as well as your assembled transcriptomes. So that could be from uh, an RNA-seq experiment uh, in different life stages or tissues, etc. And the bonus features are, of course, that um, Buscos are also ideal markers for performing um, phylogenomics analyses. And uh, because Busco, when assessing genome assemblies, is trying to predict genes, it also um, uh, produces valuable parameters and variable data to use for gene predictive training. So for a brief overview, what Busco is attempting to achieve here is to identify and classify orthologs as either complete, duplicated, so present in more than one copy, fragmented, that means an ortholog was identified, but it was not uh, completely uh, annotated, or missing. So that's a, a complete failure to identify the given Busco in your genome assembly, in your transcriptome or in your annotated set of genes. That's the basic uh, principle. Now the simplest uh, type of assessment that one might perform is on your annotated set of genes. So you would extract all the protein sequences from uh, your annotation and give them to Busco to try and identify and classify those genes as complete, duplicated, fragmented or missing. Simple steps. The next would be um, if you were starting off with a transcriptome, for example, then we first have to introduce um, the open reading frame. So identifying the 
putative protein coding regions of your transcriptome and then feed them to Busco to do the identification and classification process. Now, the most complicated is when you're trying to assess a genome assembly. This is because there are several steps that need to occur before we can start to try to identify and classify the orthologs. First step is to try to identify the regions in your genome assembly that might encode a putative orthologue to a Busco gene. That's done with uh, TBLAST10. Then to try to predict genes in these regions, because remember we're giving it just the raw genome assembly with no annotation information whatsoever. And for this, uh, we're using Augustus, but I put a little um, asterisk here because uh, Busco version five now is out in beta version. And for that, uh, we've decided to switch from Augustus to MetaUK, which also uh, removes the time consuming uh, search step in an effort to try to speed up um, the process of assessing genome assemblies. After predicting the genes, then we have a first round of identification and classification to find the complete uh, single copy Busco genes. Uh, these are then used to train Augustus, to retrain Augustus with the species specific parameters derived from the first round complete genes that were identified. A second search is then performed using a more extensive um, library of uh, sequences and the second round of prediction for all of those that failed to be found as complete in the first round. Then we have a second round of identification and classification to finally reach our um, assessment of complete, duplicated, fragmented, or missing. Now that's all uh, in the papers, all in the user guide, all fairly um, standard in terms of what Busco is trying to achieve. So here I want to just take a brief moment to explore a little bit behind the scenes of how we actually uh, create these Busco um, sets and the work that goes in to uh, building all of the uh, lineage data sets and libraries. <clears throat> so the first step is to select orthologous groups from OrthoDB at each relevant level. So what I mean by relevant level is uh, different levels in the tree of life um, that are present as single copy orthologs in 90% of the species. This is to ensure that evolutionary expectation that in any newly sequenced uh, species, these genes should be present and they should be present as single copy orthologs. <clears throat> the first step then is to uh, perform multiple sequence alignments for each of these orthologous groups. With these multiple sequence alignments, we then go on to produce hidden Markov model profiles for each alignment. We also um, produce a consensus sequence for each of these alignments. So the most common amino acid ac across the alignment, as well as a consensus sequence for each Busco. Uh, we develop uh, variants of this consensus sequence that are used in the second round search to try to identify putative regions in the genome that were missed in the first round search that only used the consensus sequences. On top of that, we also use these alignments to build the Augustus block profiles. These are simply um, scores according to the alignment that are given to Augustus to help Augustus identify the most conserved core of these proteins while it is trying to predict the genes in the genomes. Another step that uh, is perhaps not so obvious when uh, choosing the species that go in to each of the lineage data sets. Here we have a tree representation of the whole of eukaryotic uh, species in uh, OrthoDB. And here we have uh, on the left, every single species and on the right, a filtered set of species. When I say filtered, we are trying to select the best representatives from each clade to avoid biasing the alignments with an over-representation of many closely related species. So here in yellow, I'm just highlighting 
uh, mammals. So you can see there are lots of mammals that are sequenced and annotated and have ortho orthologous uh, calls in AuthoDB. But the mammals are all very, very closely related, as you can see here, compared to the diversity of eukaryota. So after selecting based on sequence identity of best reciprocal hits, we can filter out just six representative mammals to include in the whole uh, data set. So here we have a question uh, about this. How do you control for good genomes going into the Busco sets? Uh, chromosome scale genomes. So chromosome scale genomes would be one way, but if we did that, we would be left with very few because there are still not that many chromosome scale genomes available. Um, so there are two considerations for this filtering process. One, like I said, we want to remove too many closely related species. Because you can imagine if we included all of these species in the before tree, the alignment would be very much biased to this region of, of the tree where there are a lot of closely related species. <clears throat> the second criterion, of course, is the phylogenetic placement. So we would like represent representatives from as many different uh, lineages as possible. So even if the species doesn't score uh, very highly in terms of uh, completeness, we may still retain it if it has a phylogenetic position that is really informative from the perspective of building consensus sequences, building HMMs, and building these block profiles. Um, another way to control for good genomes is to iteratively select different representatives and ask how many uh, orthologous groups does one uh, retain. So if, <clears throat> if you uh, select a poorly sequenced or poorly annotated uh, species as your representative, you're going to get a lot fewer Buscos out because it is missing uh, more of these uh, core universally conserved genes and therefore the filter of being present in 90% of these species would result in fewer uh, buscos at the end. So it's, a, it's an iterative um, curated process, if you like. Uh, thank you for that uh, question. <clears throat> uh, additional filtering uh, continues after that. So um, we run the HMM profiles against all of the proteins that went in to building the alignment in the first place. <clears throat> and we, we uh, filter the scores and or we determine the score and length cutoffs to fine tune them such that the proteins that were used to build the HMMs in the first place are identified as true positives by the HMMs and homologs, those that are from other orthologous groups or not from the group in question, are correctly identified as not belonging to this orthologous group. So again, this is a, an iterative process to define the score and length cutoffs for each Busco group so that it accurately identifies its true members and no false positives. So we're trying to keep high sensitivity and specificity. And finally, we also test the profiles against uh, non-input species to try to remove those where the Augustus block profiles fail. But that's more of a, a technical consideration. We have another question. If a genome has a high number of repetitive sequences, in that case, how does Busco work during annotation? So in theory, uh, Busco is not annotating your genome. It is just looking for a given set of conserved genes in your genome. When you're annotating your genome, normally you would start by masking repetitive sequences. So in theory, the highly repetitive sequences in your genome assembly should be hidden from your annotation pipeline and hidden from the Busco assessment. So in theory, once you've done the masking, the amount or diversity of repetitive sequences in your species shouldn't adversely affect the assessment procedure. 
thank you for the for that question. <clears throat> so uh, here's a brief look at the uh, sets available in the Busco version four. And as you can see, this is a, a lot of work. So all of the selections of the orthologous groups, the building of the hidden Markov model profiles, the iterative selections and the delineation of the score cutoffs and the length cutoffs um, takes a lot of work. So uh, it doesn't happen overnight and it involves uh, a, a lot of man hours, if you like. <clears throat> so briefly uh, to summarize, um, we saw that from your annotated uh, set of genes. All we do is use the hidden Markov models to identify and classify orthologs. From your transcriptome assembly, we first find the reading, open reading frame and then use the HMMs again. Whereas from your genome assembly, we use the consensus sequences to identify regions. We use the block profiles to predict genes with Augustus. We then use the HMMs to do the classification and identification. And in this second round, we use the variants of the consensus sequences to perform a much more thorough search of the genome assembly. So even if you've uh, never uh, run Busco yourselves, if you ever do, bear in mind that assessing a genome assembly is a lot more complicated task than assessing your annotated set of genes or your transcriptome. So here we have uh, a quick quiz, uh, just to check that you're all still paying attention. Which uh, description, which should appear in uh, the chat in a moment, so that you can get the link. Which description best describes your understanding of what Busco aims to achieve? Okay, it's not appearing yet. So I will do that. Okay, so the link is now in the chat for you to be able to answer this uh, very simple question. Basically, uh, is uh, Busco attempting to assess the sequencing quality of genomic data, such as genomes, gene sets, and transcriptomes? Uh, is it trying to identify and score all the highly conserved genes in a newly sequenced and annotated genome or a transcriptome? Or is it trying to estimate uh, completeness of genomic data, such as genomes, gene sets, and transcriptomes, in terms of uh, expected gene content? Let's see if we're getting some responses. Yes, we are. Excellent. Okay, this is interesting. <clears throat> As the responses come through, so clearly we have a winner. To estimate completeness of genomic data, including genomes, gene sets, and transcriptomes, in terms of expected gene content. Nevertheless, a quarter of you still are answered to identify and score all highly conserved genes in a newly sequenced and annotated genome or transcriptome. So I purposely uh, made the answers options um, quite close to each other. So Busco is not trying to identify absolutely all universally conserved orthologs in your genome. It is trying to identify and uh, classify those orthologous genes, those universal single copy orthologs that are good markers for completeness. So expected gene content is the, the real key here. So we are trying to estimate uh, completeness in terms of expected gene content. And so in this way, it's a very um, complementary, if you like, um, tool or measure of the quality of your genome. So it is not really assessing the sequencing quality. While of course, the quality of sequencing that went into producing your genome will affect the Busco scores. That is not what Busco itself is aiming to achieve. And this is uh, important to bear in mind when you're looking at the different metrics uh, for your genome assemblies, they are often very complementary and tell you different things about the quality of your data whether it's the per base quality of the sequencing itself, 
whether it's the N50 that is attempting to describe the contiguity of all the sequences in your assembly, or in this case, whether it is a measure of the expected gene content. Have you managed to sequence and identify and annotate all the genes that should be present in your genome of interest? <clears throat> and there's a question in the Google Doc. Um, this one, I presume. So when evaluating a new genome assembly, would you consider superior or more reliable the mapping results of a reasonably good set of transcriptomes or the Busco results? I.e., if I get 90% of orthologs from Busco, but 100% of the transcripts from the transcriptome, should I be happy or should I suspect something is wrong? And the, uh, the good old question, what do you consider a good Busco value? Excellent questions. Okay, so let's start with the transcriptome. First of all, <clears throat> um, one of the aims that, that, that Busco is really trying to achieve is to provide a score that one can use to compare different assemblies from different species. So this transcriptome approach that we mentioned earlier is very good for assessing the completeness of your genome, of your species of interest. If you have a, a good set of transcripts from a lot of um, uh, different uh, tissues and um, life stages, etc., you can get a pretty good uh, uh, feeling, a, a pretty good sense of whether or not your assembly has managed to capture all of these genes that you expect because they are being transcribed. What it then doesn't do is allow you to say, is my genome assembly more or less complete in terms of genes than another genome assembly for a related species? So, you know, across a set of uh, rodents or a, a, across a set of uh, beetles, how does my assembly compare to others? Because the transcriptomics that you've done are going to be very specific to your species. So you can still get a good sense of completeness, but you won't be able to do a relative assessment, if you like, of your genome assembly compared to others of closely related species. <clears throat> so 100% of the transcripts from the transcriptome is fantastic, because um, it means that uh, everything that you've managed to sequence in your transcriptome, you can find in your genome. And indeed, uh, that of course surveys a lot more different types of genes than what we would be surveying when we we're just talking about Buscos, because Buscos are really a limited subset of all the genes in the genome based on this evolutionary expectation for them to be there and to be single copy. Whereas your transcriptomes are trying to assess a much greater diversity of all the genes that are present in your samples. Um, so you should be happy and you shouldn't suspect that something is wrong. <clears throat> On the same topic, what do you consider a good Busco value? So here I go back to this idea of um, the relative uh, comparison of your species versus other similar species. So 90% could be good for a lineage where not many other species have yet been sequenced and sampled, and therefore we don't have a very accurate estimation of this expected gene content for that given clade, right? In a clade where we have many, many more um, uh, species represented, <clears throat> then you would probably expect uh, a higher uh, Busco score. Now, given that the Buscos are selected to be present in single copy in at least 90% of the species, basically anything above 90% is good because that was the bar that was set for selecting them in the first place. This bar, however, allows for this 10% of missing genes to be missing because of evolution or to be missing because of technology. 
there's no distinction there. We, we, we do not know a priori whether or not these genes were missing um, due to a real evolutionary gene loss in that species or whether they were simply never sequenced, never assembled, and never annotated. Because the genomes of the species that we are using to build the Busco's datasets are themselves not necessarily 100% complete, beautiful, chromosomal, fully annotated genomes. We can only work with the data that we have. So hopefully that um, uh, answers that uh, question and provides some food for thought um, for the rest of you as well. <clears throat> okay. So uh, very briefly now in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, <clears throat> I would like to switch from uh, what Busco is and, and how it works to um, <clears throat> looking at a few applications in comparative genomics. So uh, this is just a pretty picture, if you like word clouds, if you don't, I'm sorry, um, of the uh, words most frequently appearing in the abstracts that uh, have been citing Busco over the years. And so unsurprisingly, we have a lot of genes and we have a lot of genomes and a lot of species and assembly and sequence. <clears throat> So here in action, um, this is uh, using Busco to answer a very simple question about the quality of your data. Here we have a selection of different uh, insect uh, gene sets <clears throat> ranging in size. Um, in, in size, by that I mean the number of predicted genes. <clears throat> and we're simply showing that here large gene sets, so genomes that were predicted to contain many, many genes, are not necessarily the most complete. So just because you have more genes doesn't mean you've got more universal single copy orthologs. And a small gene set, the, you know, the inverse, doesn't necessarily mean that you have missed or incompletely sequenced and annotated all the genes in your genome. Here in contrast, we have uh, another small gene set that scores much, much lower in Busco completeness. So this species, I would be slightly worried about the completeness of its assembly in terms of um, gene content. Whereas this species with almost the same number of genes predicted scores almost 100% and is therefore um, probably a much more reliable um, annotation set and assembly. Here I want to go back to uh, the very beginnings of the Busco development day. So this is before we had the, let's say, the, even the prototype. Um, and you, using uh, universally conserved orthologs to try to assess the quality of the mosquito genomes that we were sequencing and annotating at the time. So we have, um, I don't know, 20 or so different mosquito genomes. And here we have the uh, complete orthologs found, the ones found duplicated in blue, and the ones missing, putatively missing in red. <clears throat> and please note, I've committed the cardinal sin of cutting the axis at 80%, but uh, we need to in order to zoom in here. And there's a couple of points to note here. So first of all, most of our genome assemblies are remarkably complete in terms of genes. So yay, we're happy. Most of the data that we've produced seems to be pretty good. Um, then uh, one to note here is um, Anopheles uh, maculatus, which has the lowest completeness all the way down to 84% here with uh, quite a high level uh, of duplication and the most missing uh, orthologs. And indeed, this uh, mosquito genome, Anopheles maculatus, was the most highly fragmented of all the assemblies that we were working with at that time. So this uh, assessment of gene space is reflecting the quality of the underlying assembly here. In contrast, we have uh, a second one, Anopheles christii here, <clears throat> um, which is here, which was also almost as fragmented as the uh, maculatus assembly, <clears throat> just a little bit better. But in terms of gene space, it's actually doing pretty well. So while it does have quite a few multi-copy hits, uh, 
most of the orthologs have been found. So this little red bar here is pretty small. So in this case, even though Anopheles Christiae genome assembly was rather fragmented, we could say at least we had managed to recover most of the genes that we were expecting to. And a final example here in terms of uh, duplicates in Anopheles mellus. So here, this um, species with the biggest uh, blue uh, fraction, if you like, <clears throat> this alerted us to the fact that uh, our assembly had failed to reduce haplotypes, uh, to collapse haplotypes. So uh, the assembly for the species uh, contained uh, alternative haplotypes of the same uh, haploid region of the genome. And so we had to go back in for a second round of assembly and cleaning up of the haplotype information uh, to try to get a better representation of the haploid um, genome assembly for Anopheles mellus. So just a couple of examples of the kind of red flags that this kind of analysis can throw up. And then you can go back to your data to try to find out what is the underlying problem. Here, perhaps a more typical um, scenario of the use of Busco <clears throat> in, a, in a publication, in a paper, or in the supplementary materials. This goes back to the question we discussed earlier about showing how well does my species genome and gene set uh, score in comparison to other related species. So here we're looking at the, the focal species of this beetle, the Asian longhorn beetle, and we assess the completeness of its genome and its gene set in the context of a whole lot of other insects. So here you can get pretty quickly an idea that it is as good as or better than most other sequenced and assembled insects at the time. And that's the main message that you're trying to get across to your collaborators, to the community, eventually to the reviewers of your paper, that the data that you have produced is as good as or better than the current standard in the field and is therefore useful now to proceed with your downstream comparative genomics analysis. Uh, here, uh, uh, just to not focus on arthropods all the time, I have an example from plant genomes and gene sets. <clears throat> so in plants, they had already identified a core set of genes that they were using to perform a similar kind of assessment of the completeness of um, different plant genomes. Um, and just here in this example, uh, it's a nice example of where the Busco genome score is much, much higher than the Busco gene set score. Uh, here in dark green, the genome, uh, way above 95% and the gene sets uh, just maybe breaching 90%. And this is a red flag for your genome being much more complete than your annotated gene set, telling you that perhaps you need to go back and reassess your annotation protocol because it failed to identify all the genes that should be present in your genome assembly. So very briefly, that's uh, the more obvious uses uh, for quality control. But now, uh, quickly to show you some examples of Busco uses beyond quality control in <clears throat> comparative genomics, um, the training of gene predictor algorithms, and in phylogenomic analyses. So in comparative genomics, our downstream analyses after comparing all against all species to identify orthologs, for example, are going to be sensitive to the quality of the data of your input data sets. And so therefore assessing the completeness of the gene space using Busco can be a, a useful mechanism for selecting the species that you want to include in your analysis. Now, several years ago, of course, you would probably just take all the species that were available but now these days, with many, many more genomes being sequenced and annotated, we can afford to be a little bit picky in the ones that we choose to include in our comparative genomics analyses. So obviously other factors will come into play, like the taxonomic sampling, uh, the availability of complementary functional genomics data. So do you have expression data for the species? Do you have population genomics data for this species? 
But all else being equal, you can use Busco to try to provide a logical uh, selection criteria to help you focus on really the, the, the genomic resources that are of the best quality to use to address your questions. <clears throat> And here, just uh, showing an example from the world of bacteria, where obviously, if you're looking at the number of missing bus buscos on the x-axis and the number of fragmented buscos on the y-axis, if you want a, a few streptomyces genomes to include in your analyses, which ones are you going to pick? You're obviously going to pick representatives from down here, where there are very few or no missing buscos and very few or no fragmented buscos. And you're going to avoid including any of these lower quality genomes for the same species. Uh, this more or less uh, represents the same kind of idea. Um, the, the little triangles are a little bit hard to see in, in these plots, but the point is they are the um, reference genome assemblies as specified according to NCBI um, assembly database. And all I'm trying to show here is that there are non-reference assemblies that are as good as or better than some of those assemblies that are marked as reference assemblies in NCBI. So just going on a tag that says, this is a reference, this is the best, is not necessarily always the safest uh, route to go. And you can use Busco to um, <clears throat> obtain a much more qualitative a quantitative assessment of which are the best representatives to use. Briefly, in terms of gene predictor training, um, it's a complex task, and uh, especially when supporting evidence is lacking, and you have to perform uh, ab initio predictions. Um, and so gene prediction tools are very often the first step is to try to optimize their parameters for each species that they are trying to predict genes in, in order to achieve the best results. And so uh, optimizing these predictors is usually performed by using a predefined set of high quality genes to start with, uh, quite often from a sort of RNA-seq analysis. <clears throat> now, buscos, because they are widely conserved, um, uh, they are often uh, found to be really good for uh, use as a predefined set uh, to use in a gene predictor for their uh, parameterization and training step. So basically, you can use the first round of complete Busco matches to train Augustus, as a Busco already does, but you can also use those complete matches to feed to any other gene predictor that is using um, a training step to fine tune the parameters for the species under investigation. And so here, just very briefly to illustrate this point, um, let me take uh, the example of a butterfly here. So Danaeus plexippus, um, the top, uh, firstly, the more dark blue that you see in this plot, the closer the ab initio annotation matches the official gene set annotation. So the more dark blue you have, the closer you are to the true annotated truth. If you use uh, fly parameters, so that is parameters trained on the fruit fly to run an Augustus ab initio prediction, you get this level of match to the official annotation set. Whereas if you use the parameters that were trained using Busco arthropoda gene set, then the, you get a massive improvement in the amount of match between your ab initio prediction and the official gene set. So that's just one example of where you could use the parameters uh, that are built during uh, Busco analysis to perform better ab initio gene predictions across your new genome assembly. Uh, lastly, uh, these are universal single copy orthologs, so they are inherently reliable uh, gene markers for phylogenomic analyses. That is for estimating the true phylogenetic uh, relationships among the organisms that you are trying to study. And this is almost a prerequisite for any evolutionary study that you might go on to perform afterwards. 
And so they represent a predefined set of reliable markers that you can use in phylogenomics uh, studies. Uh, and this is illustrated here where we have um, some rodents where some of them we have only transcriptome data sets. So these asterisks indicate we don't have a genome, we only have a transcriptome. And some we have genomes, so the, 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 the mouse, for example. Um, and we can perform a Busco analysis using either the Metazoa um, data set or the more, uh, the larger Mammalia data set or the even uh, larger Eurocontaglius data set to identify um, Busco matches in the transcriptome and the genomes. Subsequently, filter to identify all of those that were identified in all of the species in question and then build a super alignment of the amino acids that were identified as buscos in each of the species to then build the molecular species phylogeny. So obviously analyzing with higher resolution data sets means you get more uh, markers to use for your phylogenomic um, assessment. But in this case, at least, using either the mammalia or metazoa, produced a reliable phylogeny um, that agreed with uh, all three different uh, data sets. <clears throat> so I hope that I've uh, managed to explain a bit about how Busco works and what it's trying to do and convince you for its uh, utility in its main purpose, which is the quality control of genomics data but also highlights just a few extra um, uses of the results from your Brusco analyses in selecting species for comparative genomics analysis, in uh, training your gene predictors to annotate your genomes, and in uh, large-scale uh, phylogenomic analyses to determine the evolutionary relationships among the species that you're interested in. And because we're on to the end of the hour now, I'm going to wrap it up there um, with hopefully you now having a better idea of what Busco is, how it works and how it's built and the kinds of things that we can use Busco for. So I see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, please go ahead if you have any others that we can briefly address now before taking a short break because we are over the hour. Um, okay, so we have a question here, it's quite a specific one. For species with almost 50% completed genome, shows us that potentially we do not have yet enough genomics responses. So not confident enough to continue with comparative analysis. Okay, I should <clears throat> try and translate that, that question a little bit, yes. So if you go back to what we were talking about um, first thing this morning and orthology delineation, if you imagine trying to build that uh, all against all graph that we were talking about, where we're looking for best reciprocal hits between all pairs of species, if one of the species that you're including in this analysis is incomplete and, and dramatically so, then of course you're going to miss a lot of those best reciprocal hits. Your graph is going to be incomplete and therefore your inference of orthology is going to be impacted by that incomplete graph. So yes, an incompletely annotated or incompletely sequenced genome will limit the kinds of analyses or the quality of the kinds of analyses that you can then perform downstream. So while some cases you're stuck with the data that you have and you have to move forward no matter what, but at least you know that this is the case with your data and therefore any downstream interpretations that you make, you need to take into account what could be arising from technical artifacts. Or if it's not your focal species, you can simply avoid those that are less than perfect if you like and choose a related representative species for your comparative analysis that is much more complete in terms of expected gene content 
so that you can then be more confident with your orthology calling, your tree building, or any downstream comparative genomics analyses that you want to perform. Uh, yeah, so thank you for, for that question. Uh, one more question before we break. Um, in Busco, can I browse the already built database, Busco genes, and compare species for of genes of interest part of a pathway. Okay, I'm struggling to understand that one. So perhaps we can copy and paste that one into the Google Doc where we can elaborate on it and then I can try to answer in full perhaps after the break. Um, okay, so we are seven minutes past the hour. <clears throat> so I think it's good for us to take a little break now. Uh, before we come back for uh, the third part of this uh, lecture series. Um, so, according to my clock, it's eight minutes past. So, let's uh, say at 20 past 11, so in 12 minutes' time, uh, we will reconvene for the third part of this morning's uh, discussions. Thank you very much, and see you all in. Okay, good. So we have everyone on board for the third and final session of this morning. Uh, thank you for all the questions. And I see a couple more in the Google Docs um, that perhaps uh, we can get to at the end if we have time. I'll, I'll try and keep this last one uh, fairly short, especially because it's already 20 past uh, the hour. Um, but please, yeah, continue to uh, put the questions in the chat and the Google Doc, and we will get to them at some point. <clears throat> So in this uh, third uh, part, I'm now going to shift from talking about uh, sort of methods in orthology and uh, what uh, Busco is aiming to achieve and how it does it to uh, try to provide you with a few um, real world examples, if you like, of comparative genomics uh, using uh, arthropod genomes, where I just want to briefly uh, set up uh, the question in each case, and then uh, talk through the approach that we used to try to address the question, and then a uh, brief look at the result. And these are really just um, tiny little uh, snippets uh, of real world examples to give you a flavor of how uh, orthology and uh, Busco uh, can be used uh, to answer questions in uh, comparative genomics. So, uh, the first one, we're going to look at uh, possibly some questions that are, you know, some of you might be asking of your own genomic data. I've done my annotation. I predicted a very small gene set. Uh, why? Is this real? Or the opposite. Um, I finished my round of annotations and I have way, way, way more genes than I thought I was going to have because other related species have fewer. Um, also, uh, I've been working really, really hard to improve my annotation. Has it actually improved at all? Um, then also uh, looking at how we can use in a bit more detail um, the uh, Busco results for building uh, species phylogenies. And then uh, finally, um, uh, I, I think a, a nice little example that goes a little bit beyond orthology because uh, orthology, we're usually uh, focusing on the genes for which we can recognize equivalent counterparts in different species. But we usually tend to ignore the fraction of genes that appear to be lineage specific or species specific. And so uh, how can we find out uh, what these genes might be doing? What are their functions? Because uh, orthology and homology are, are not helping us here. So in the first example, uh, we focus on Pediculus humanus, which is the human body louse, uh, which you can see a little cute picture of up at the top, um, if you're not too offended by lice. And here the question is, uh, from a comparative genomics perspective, because this body louse is an obligate parasite uh, that lives on our bodies, um, it, it has a small genome. Is there any evidence 
now that we've sequenced and annotated the genome, that it has lost genes over evolutionary time by genome reduction. And this comes from the idea that uh, obligate parasites that live in a very controlled environment where they might be obtaining nutrients from their direct host might uh, lose genes over evolutionary time that are no longer uh, necessary for their survival because of this niche that they have adapted to. So that's the, um, the evolutionary question, if you like. We, we, we've sequenced the genome, it's small, there are few genes. Is this because of evolutionary loss driven by some sort of uh, genome reduction process? <clears throat> and so the approach that we uh, designed to try to answer this question is we first uh, perform orthology delineation with representatives from different insect orders and an outgroup. So this comes uh, to what we were discussing about earlier, um, selecting the right kinds of species uh, to uh, perform your comparative genomics analyses. Now I will say this is back in 2010, so we didn't have many species to choose from back in 2010, <laughs> um, but we did have representatives from different uh, insect orders and an outgroup in order to design this experiment. Once we have delineated uh, orthologs across our selected species, we can then uh, examine or count the numbers of orthologs that are shared amongst different pairs and different sets of species in our analysis. So that's the question and the approach. And this is more or less uh, the summary of uh, what it looks like in terms of counting the number of shared orthologs. So on the left, we have the species phylogeny. We have uh, Drosophila melanogaster, Tribolium castaneum, uh, Nasonia vitropenis, and Pediculus humanus, and our outgroup species, uh, Daphnia pulex and Homo sapiens. And what this Venn diagram is showing here is the number of orthologs that are shared between each uh, pair or combination of species. So here in the center, we see we have 5,693 orthologous groups that are present in all four of these species. 80 that are present only in the dipterans, 163 that are present only in the body louse, et cetera. And the key numbers that we want to look at now are the orthologs that are shared between our little body louse here and uh, Nasonia vitropenis here in yellow or Tribolium castaneum in uh, green compared to how many they share with Drosophila melanogaster, the fly. And what we can see is that uh, uh, compared to uh, Nasonia vitropenis or uh, Tribolium castaneum, the body louse shares more, has more orthologs in common with the wasp compared to the fly. So 182 is bigger than 141. And it has more orthologs in common with the beetle than the beetle does with the fly. So 275 is bigger than 213. So it seems that this uh, body louse has more exclusive orthologs in common with uh, beetles and wasps than either of them do with flies, despite them being more evolutionary closely related to flies. So that's already an indication that um, the body louse actually has maintained many ancient uh, insect orthologs. The other contrast that we can make is uh, here in red, showing the number of orthologs that the body louse shares exclusively with both the wasp and the beetle compared to what they share with uh, Drosophila melanogaster. And here the contrast is much bigger. So uh, 576 compared to 395. So again, this is pointing to uh, a conserved set of orthologs that are present in all insects, including our body louse, but in fact are not present in the much more derived uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the dipterans, suggesting that the body louse has in fact maintained this uh, ancient repertoire of conserved insect orthologs, rather than having suffered losses 
So it suggests that instead of undergoing some sort of large scale gene loss to reach, to reach this lower overall uh, gene content, um, it's, it's not because of uh, some progressive loss in the sort of parasite uh, lifestyle um, sense. So in, perhaps instead, this small gene set that we observe could be due to a lack of duplications, a lack of gene family expansions, rather than an excessive loss of ancient conserved genes. So here again, we can use the orthology data. And we're here filtering to look for orthologous groups with at least one ortholog in each of our four representative species, but with a total of at least six genes. So these are orthologous groups that are present in all species where at least one or two duplications have happened over their evolutionary span. The first thing to note is that less than half of the orthologs have a duplication in the body louse, compared to 60, 70, or 65% of the groups in the wasp, beetle, and fly that contain the duplications. So more of these groups are showing duplications in the wasp, beetle, and fly than they are in our body louse. And also what's shown here in the box plots is that the body louse in purple has a lower overall mean and median uh, proportions of orthologs in these orthologous groups. And this is statistically significantly different. So it's basically saying that uh, instead of uh, gene losses leading to a small gene set, what we have is fewer gene duplications, fewer expansions of gene families in the body louse, which again, we could possibly relate to its uh, lifestyle, um, close association with mammals over evolutionary time. Uh, obviously, we are its uh, host at the moment, but uh, our ancestors long before us um, hosted it over the years, um, may provide a sort of protected, stable environment where having many copies of genes, such as uh, those perhaps involved in sensing your environment or communicating with others, are less important and less needed than in insects that are free living, such as the wasps or the beetles or the flies that have to navigate uh, their environments and therefore uh, the expansions of gene families and gene duplications that allow for a bigger repertoire of genes for sensing and interacting with the environment could be driving the higher copy numbers in those species rather than a gene loss uh, contributing to the lower number of genes in our body louse. And this slide you've seen before, but just to reiterate that this is the body louse that we were talking about um, in this study, where despite having very, very few total genes, uh, way below the median for this set of insects at least, uh, it showed a remarkably uh, complete uh, genome in terms of uh, Busco score. So here we can establish that this small gene set is not necessarily incomplete and that it has not uh, arisen because of progressive losses of genes over evolutionary time, but it's more likely a result of expansions that are occurring in free living species. So that's the, the kind of approach that I'm, I'm hoping to, to, to work through for each of these examples. Setting up the question, having a look at the approach, and then looking at the result. Now we have the opposite scenario where we have many, many more genes than we might have expected, and we want to find out why. Is this a technical problem, or is there perhaps something uh, about the biology of these species that could explain the uh, larger gene set? And here we turn to uh, mosquitoes, my favorite. So this is uh, Culex quinquefasciatus, the vector of West Nile virus. And the first thing to notice uh, here, we have um, a typical orthology plot for Culex quinquefasciatus, Aedes aegypti, another mosquito, and Anopheles gambi, the malaria mosquito. Um, and our newly sequenced Culex genome was annotated and it had many, many more genes than the two previously sequenced mosquitoes. So we needed to uh, establish whether or not this rather large predicted gene set is uh, simply due to the inclusion of 
uh, many haplotype regions. So we mentioned this earlier during genome assembly of a diploid organism. If you have high heterozygosity, it can often be difficult to uh, fully collapse the essentially the two uh, alleles that you're sequencing into the single haploid genome. And so you can end up with certain regions of the genome included in your assembly uh, twice or, or multiple times. If these regions contain genes, then of course you're going to predict more genes, you're going to annotate more genes, and you're going to look like you have a higher uh, copy number of genes, where in, in fact it's an artifact of your assembly process. So this is the question that we wanted to try to address. So the approach that we took is to again use orthology delineation to identify pairs of paralogs in each of these species. So within the species uh, Aedes aegypti and Office gambi and Culex quinquefasciatus. Then we asked the uh, simple question of um, what does the percent identity distribution look like for all the pairs of paralogs uh, and differentiate those that occur on the same scaffold with those that occur on different scaffolds. So this is 2010. So we're still talking scaffolds. We don't really have chromosomal level assemblies. And <clears throat> I'll try to explain why uh, we contrasted the percent identity distributions between paralogs on the same scaffold versus paralogs on different scaffolds in the next slide. So first of all, globally across all paralogs, what we're looking at here on the x-axis is the percent identity of 44,000 Culex, 37,000 Aedes, and 20,000 Anopheles pairs of paralogs from the highly identical, probably very young paralogs, so recent gene duplications, all the way back to the much older, barely detectable paralogs with much lower uh, percent identity. And indeed, if we look at the blue line here, which is uh, Culex, we can see it does have a higher number of very highly similar paralogs. Now, where might those highly similar paralogs be coming from? This goes back to our uh, question about possibly including alternative haplotypes in the assembly. The alternative haplotypes are different enough to have failed to be collapsed during the assembly process but they are still very similar because they are currently circulating alleles in the population. So genes that have been erroneously included in the assembly multiple times would appear to have very high sequence identity because they are very uh, close. They are alternative alleles. They're not even uh, duplications if they're coming from the haplotypes. So it does look like the Culex mosquito has slightly more of these very closely related paralogs than the other species, which could suggest that indeed we have included uh, multiple haplotypes or we failed to collapse those haplotypes in our genome assembly. <clears throat> so this is where it becomes important now to distinguish between paralog pairs that are on different contigs or chromosomes and paralog pairs that are on the same contig or chromosome. Now this uh, requires a little bit of an explanation. Gene duplications that occur locally in the genome are going to produce tandem copies of paralogs, all within uh, a short genomic region around the original progenitor gene. Whereas haplotype regions are generally going to be much longer and are not going to be assembled into a contiguous uh, supercontig uh, like the duplicated genes, like the truly duplicated genes. So it's a bit of a technical assumption, but it's uh, the basis for what we're going to use to try and distinguish between what we consider real gene duplications, so those that have happened and have stayed next to each other in the genome, probably real gene duplications, and those that are present in different uh, contexts or different scaffolds, and that therefore may be more likely to be uh, 
from haplotype regions that we fail to collapse. So first of all, uh, on different uh, chromosomes or different supercontexts, in fact, now um, the blue line, which is Culex, goes way down to about the same expected value for Anopheles, the red line. So it doesn't look like there's an over uh, representation of paralog pairs on different supercontexts, which would indicate potentially a problem with haplotypes. Instead, that uh, high number of close paralogs that we saw in the previous slide are almost all coming from paralog pairs that are on the same supercontext, same chromosome. So they are local tandem gene duplications. And so therefore we expect that these are much more likely to be real tandem gene duplications rather than a problem with failing to collapse the haplotypes. If these two graphs had been inverted, then indeed we would say that we probably have a problem with the haplotype regions and we need to go back into our assembly to try to correct for those errors. So it does uh, have many, many more genes and it doesn't look like the paralogs are coming from the erroneous inclusion of haplotypes. And here we can see again that in this orthology plot, the all the categories with N in Culex are greater in Culex. So <clears throat> this uh, blue region, uh, the brown region, and the purple region are all bigger in Culex. So these are uh, orthologous groups that contain multiple copies of a gene that is also found in the other two mosquitoes. What we haven't managed to resolve with this approach, of course, is uh, what's going on here with this large fraction of apparently lineage specific or species specific genes. So here a comparative genomics approach is not really going to help us because we can't identify orthologs in the first place. So to try and get a feeling for whether these are real gene annotations or not, you would need to perform some sort of um, transcriptomics, map them back to the assembly and quantify the expression levels of these genes to give yourself uh, confidence that they might actually be real genes encoding real proteins performing real biological functions. This being back in 2010, uh, we didn't do that. So this uh, fraction remains a mystery, but at least um, the high uh, duplicated uh, genes and the paralogs that we were able to identify don't look as though they are coming from erroneously uh, included haplotype regions. So now, um, as uh, genomes go through several different versions of improvements with uh, new technologies uh, being used to improve the assembly and therefore uh, often require a re-annotation, um, a question that is important to ask at that point is, did my genome assembly upgrade and genome annotation upgrade actually work? So do we now have genomic resources that are better than what we had uh, a year ago? And for this, we'll look at the example of improving the honeybee genome annotations. So we've done a lot of work to try to identify more genes uh, correctly in the genome of the honeybee. But has all of this effort actually paid off? Do we now have a better annotated gene set in this species? Uh, and you can see it's... Uh, the approaches that we used uh, involved a lot of people and basically every single thing you can possibly think of. Uh, from back then, lots of uh, ESTs, lots of manual curation. Um, and I think I have it, yes, on the next slide here. So running 32 different annotation sets, comparing them and trying to produce a consensus gene set of all of the different um, predictions, looking at um, uh, conservation with uh, RefSeq uh, sequences and peptides to uh, also quantify back in those days Sigma because Busco didn't exist, uh, the conserved core set <clears throat> uh, to try and uh, identify the best possible consensus of all of these annotation sets, uh, which finally resulted in an official gene set which uh, contained 5,000 more genes than the original annotation of the honeybee genome 
uh, which was done back in 2006, I think. So we have 5,000 more genes, but are they better? Are they real? Um, does it actually uh, result in an improved annotation compared to the first official gene set? Uh, just briefly here, we have a question from the last example. Is there any particular software which can help with comparing paralogs on different contigs versus the same contig? Or does this just require a bit of manual work? Um, I'm not aware of any software that does that, um, but it's fairly simple to do. Once you have your orthology delineated, then you can identify all pairs of paralogs and if you have the GFF files, so then you know where those genes are located in your genome, you can simply flag each pair, whether or not it's on the same or different uh, contigs or scaffolds, and then produce a similar plot to the ones that we just saw. So I'm not aware of anything particular that does that job, but it's, it's, um, it should be fairly doable um, with uh, minimal um, programming skills. <clears throat> okay, so what we did here for the honeybee um, uh, annotation set was to assess the quality of the new uh, set. We didn't have Busco in those days, so instead we were counting the number of rare gene losses. But you can already see how uh, these kinds of questions are leading us to start thinking about developing Busco in order to have a one-stop shop that can uh, answer these questions for us instead of uh, coming up with creative uh, design uh, experiments to try to convince ourselves that the genomic data that we've produced is good or better than what we had before. So of course rare gene losses can happen but we can also use them just as we do in Busco as an estimate for how many genes might be missing from your annotation set. So here, very briefly, we have a selection of arthropod species, and uh, we are counting the number of orthologous groups for which there are orthologs in all the other species, but not in this given species. So basically, the larger these bars are, the more potentially missing orthologs that species has. Now, in this case, I would say ignore the out group because that's not really a fair comparison here. Um, they're, they're quite likely to be missing uh, more orthologs simply because they are the out group in this analysis. And what we want to focus on here are the three hymenopteran species because that's more like for like evolutionarily speaking. We have the honeybee before and we have the honeybee after and then we have two ant species here. And basically what this is telling us is that there were many, many more uh, orthologous groups that were missing a counterpart in the honeybee in version two annotation. And this is about halved in our latest version 3.2 annotation, suggesting that all the work that we did to try to improve the annotation actually did recover more uh, widely conserved orthologs. So now uh, moving on to uh, using uh, this for phylogenomic questions. Um, here we have uh, the question that I need a species phylogeny in order to proceed with my evolutionary analysis, but I want to include some species for which we don't yet have a genome, for which we don't yet have a genome annotation, for which we don't have orthology. How could I possibly uh, come up with a uh, strategy so that I can include species, both uh, those that do have genomes and annotations and those for which I could only find a transcriptome assembly uh, from a collaborator or from NCBI, but I would really like to include them in um, my species phylogeny. So here uh, we use uh, Busco in two different modes. So we use it uh, in the genome mode to assess genomes that we have available and we use it in the transcriptome mode to assess the transcriptomes that we have available. Then we take the results from the genomes and from the transcriptomes and we identify the conserved set of Buscos that were found in all of the genomes and that were found in in this case both of the transcriptomes. So we have uh, two transcriptomes here and the rest are all genomes. 
So we can identify the buscos in the transcriptomes, combine them with the buscos that we identify from eight other genomes, produce a super alignment of uh, amino acid sequences, <clears throat> and use that for phylogeny inference, in this case, uh, using a software called uh, Raxamel. And here we were able to in build a species phylogeny with representatives of different arthropod uh, insect orders. The new genome that we had just sequenced and annotated. And at that point, there were no other odonate genomes available. There were only a couple of transcriptomes available. But by applying this uh, combined approach, we were able to include them in the species phylogeny. So we had more than one odonate uh, representative in our species phylogeny. This one you've seen before, where again, we were using uh, data from transcriptomes and from genomes, assessing them with three different uh, Busco lineage data sets with different levels of resolution, identifying those that are in common amongst all our species, using those to build a super uh, alignment, and then using those super alignments to build the species phylogeny. And this is uh, along the lines of one of the um, practicals that we will be tackling in the class uh, this afternoon. So finally, in the, the last few minutes, I would like to uh, present a last example of comparative genomics from arthropods uh, using uh, orthology, but in this case, looking at these lineage specific genes for which we often uh, have no idea uh, what their biological functions might be. Here we turn to the uh, Hessian fly, uh, which is uh, renowned for uh, secreting through its saliva into the wheat plants that it's uh, feeding on a number of uh, effector proteins that uh, control and limit the ability of the wheat plant to reject the Hessian fly larvae that are feeding on the wheat plant. So our approach in this case, because we're asking a functional genomics question, we also require transcriptomics, not just comparative genomics. But here we're going to combine the transcriptomics with the comparative genomics to partition the genes according to whether or not they are found in other species or whether they are specific to the Hessian fly, and then use the transcriptome data to see whether or not these species-specific genes are coming from the saliva and in fact might be the key proteins that are responsible for this manipulation of the plant host. So this kind of plot, uh, you've seen a couple of them uh, already today, this morning. Uh, where we have the widely conserved uh, genes across all species on the left. And as we move to the right, we have uh, more uh, lineage specific and finally species specific genes. And here is our uh, Hessian fly, appropriately uh, called um, M destructor for the <laughs> destruction that it causes to wheat across the world. And here we have 15% uh, of all genes predicted in its genome that showed no orthology to any of the other genomes, uh, species that were included in our analysis. When we looked at what those genes uh, might encode by comparing them to the transcriptome from the salivary gland, a very large chunk, so this uh, yellow chunk here of these lineage specific uh, genes matched those that were found in the saliva, in the salivary gland uh, transcriptome, either in the self homology only category or with no significant homology to any other protein. So just to zoom in, this is the yellow bit that we're talking about here. And so compared to most of the other sequenced genomes, uh, the Hessian fly had a large fraction of genes without homologs in other organisms, but within this fraction, there were almost a thousand of these salivary gland proteins with um, a, a perfect match to the annotations in the genome, with uh, two, nearly 300 of them present um, in the single copy no homology fraction, 
but a large fraction, this uh, <clears throat> dark uh, yellow one, in the multi-copy self-homology only fraction. What, we're, what this means is that in the Hessian fly genome, this kind of protein with this overall structure that appears so far to be unique to the Hessian fly, until we start sequencing more flies, it's going to be uh, unique. So it appeared at some point in the evolutionary history of this lineage and has subsequently duplicated many times because it has created this large repertoire of more than 600 uh, cell homology only uh, genes in the Hessian fly genome. So clearly it's an important gene family because there's many of them. And by doing the transcriptomics, we could establish that in fact, a lot of them are being expressed and sec secreted into the saliva and are therefore likely to be some of the key uh, molecules, key proteins that are involved in uh, manipulating the wheat plant host response as it tries to fight off um, the, uh, the larvae of the Hessian fly. So that was a, a slightly alternative uh, example to using orthology in comparative genomics, where for once we actually focused on those genes for which we could not identify any significant orthology. So hopefully with these uh, examples, um, you get a flavor of some of the questions that uh, we can ask in comparative genomics for which we can use orthology data and or uh, Busco assessments to try to reach uh, a conclusion. Sometimes it's uh, technical, trying to make sure that the data you've produced are good, good quality and uh, usable for downstream comparative genomics analyses. Other times to uh, build a species phylogeny, which is gonna be important for almost any uh, downstream uh, evolutionary analysis that you want to do. And finally, looking at uh, the genes that we normally ignore, those poor little uh, no orthology category uh, orthologs, uh, uh, genes at the end of those uh, orthology plots. So that just gives you a little bit of a flavor of uh, some applications of uh, orthology and Busco in arthropod comparative genomics. And that leaves us just a few minutes at the end for me to take any questions that might be in the Google Doc or any questions generally about any of the presentations uh, that we've been through uh, this morning. An interesting one, yes. I do manual curation to bring context containing missing Busco genes into a de novo assembly from assemblies generated with other assemblers, for example, to improve my Busco score. Is this just cheating my Busco score to make the genome appear better? Or can I assume it brings in other missing genes which are also on the context alongside the core Busco genes? Would you recommend this strategy? <laughs> perhaps uh, we should have a poll to see how many of the audience would recommend this strategy. Uh, no, basically, this is cheating. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this strategy at all. Um, all manual manipulation that you perform on your assemblies afterwards should be uh, limited to cleaning out contamination, cleaning out errors, correcting um, incorrect scaffolding. So especially now with some of the, the high C data, uh, there are in fact tools to be able to visualize how your assembly has been put together um, and highlight potential errors that could benefit from some manual curation. So basically I, I, would, I would recommend against it. Um, you are cheating the system because you're bringing in Busco genes just to get a better Busco score. At the end of the day, you are going to use your genome and your genome annotation to answer your biological or your evolutionary questions. And you're going to provide this data to the community, hopefully, um, for them to use to ask and answer their questions. So by simply 
pulling in extra context to bring your BUSCO score up, I don't think you're doing anyone any favors in the long run. Um, you just need to keep working at uh, your assembly strategy, uh, fine tuning the parameters and trying different approaches, uh, especially with uh, pre-processing, for example, of some of the reads uh, to eventually arrive at an assembly that is both uh, scoring well in terms of Busco completeness, but also showing good contiguity and other uh, metrics that we use typically for uh, quantifying the completeness and quality of your genome assembly. So uh, a nice question there to, to finish on. Um, yep, my official recommendation is uh, don't do it because it'll only come back to bite you in the future.